In this talk, I'll be talking about uh, time value of lightning. So first up, kind of the, the yield on lightning. Uh, the, the risks, uh, the, the service that is actually being provided, the tools to, that, that you can use to start earning some of that, and also some of the market data that we're getting out of it. So how can you earn Bitcoin? Um, well, uh, a lot of people are into the whole yield idea, but uh, if you don't know where the yield is coming from, uh, you are the yield. Uh, so the alternative is to actually provide a valuable product or service. Uh, so the, the service that's actually being provided on the Lightning Network is reliable payments. Um, and uh, Nick Batia has kind of uh, referred to this as like the risk-free rate for, for, for Bitcoin, uh, which is an interesting idea, but it's not truly risk-free. So um, overall, there, there are risks, and we've gotten away with some of those. Um, one, the, the counterparty risk and inflation. We don't have to worry about the money supply in increasing with Bitcoin. We already know what the, the Bitcoin supply schedule is going to be. Um, in addition, uh, whenever you're running a node and you have funds on there, you do have to, like there is risks about the Bitcoin protocol having a bug. Now, like after 14 years um, of, this, uh, of this protocol being run, uh, I think we're all pretty comfortable with that, with that risk. Um, in addition, like running a node, you've got a hot wallet. So internet connected nodes uh, have a larger attack surface. Uh, I think most folks are comfortable with that. Um, in addition, there's the lightning protocol. Now we've got a protocol that's uh, five years old on, on top of that. Um, and as we've seen recently, uh, there have been bugs in, in lightning. So uh, L&D uh, had, had two bugs this year. Um, which required some some fast actions to to help solve those, but didn't really affect the money. Uh, I don't know of any stories of loss of funds because of that. Um, so implementation wise, the, those bugs were on L and D. There's also Core Lightning and Eclair. Uh, there's also a third one, a uh, fourth one for uh, Electrum. Now, like other risks, and I highlighted these ones, is actual hardware. Um, where are you storing your node? Uh, what are you using to, to keep your, your funds taken care of? Um, at this point, I've blown up three different Raspberry Pis. Um, and a lot of those were due to not having reliable power. Like I had a power outage and uh, didn't have a, a UPS set up, which is an uninterruptible power supply. Now, like anybody in PlebNet would highly, highly recommend um, using a UPS uh, to make sure that like, you don't have to worry about power surges or power outages. Um, and then the last one is user error. Um, as uh, anybody that has popped up in PlebNet, which is a Lightning community, can attest, uh, there's lots of people that are learning very rapidly uh, what not to do. But uh, Enough about the risks. What's the service that's being provided? And it's a, it's a functional, efficient settlement service. And so what you're going for is high payment reliability, great connectivity, have it be low cost and high speed. So the service that you're actually doing is, is connecting. So it's, it's connecting uh, customers to businesses, businesses to businesses, and uh, within communities and between communities. So one of the early features that we added on Amboss was to actually like join a community. And in a bunch of Telegram groups, you'll, you'll see people uh, like looking to get approvals into these different groups. And we haven't done much with it yet, uh, but we're, we're working on a uh, next iteration, which I'll be very pleased to announce. Um, but like as far as communities go, like PlebNet is a big one. Uh, Diamond Hands is a community of node runners in Japan. Uh, we got Rings of Fire like all over the world. Um, uh, Lightning NL in Netherlands, Pubs to El Salvador, and Einen Svansig in Germany. As far as like visitors to Amboss, um, we do get a ton from Japan, 
as well as uh, Germany and Netherlands. Uh, so like behind, like obviously the biggest one is the U.S., but after that, um, it's it's Germany and then uh, Japan and Netherlands. Why do you think that is? I don't know. Um, like those are like developed, uh, old developed countries, um, and they've got they've got like savings to deploy on on the Lightning Network, and like they've got access to electronics, maybe, but. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I don't really know. But. Maybe they have like uh, a bunch of code nodes, which is like. Yeah, I, I haven't uh, done the breakdown of like how many people are doing tour, but uh, yeah, I mean, we can find that out. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, these uh, these communities aren't based on the, the IP that they're using, uh, but we do um, try and figure out like, Okay, what country is this IP coming from? The IP that they're publicly broadcasting. Um, so, like node runners are creating payment networks. So, this is one of the displays that we use uh, on Amboss. It's a it's a capacity map. So, the size of the channels. So, here I've got a channel to Amboss Space, uh, Purse.io, um, and a whole bunch of uh, other like plebs. Silent Link and BTC pins. Uh, Silent Link does um, like SIM cards uh, that you can buy with Lightning. But uh, yeah, people are opening and closing channels, uh, rebalancing, buying channels, and and swapping. And when I say swaps, I mean going from Lightning to on chain and on chain to Lightning. And that's a, a service. Uh, the most common one is the Loop service put out by Lightning Labs. Um, but we also added that to our marketplace. So speaking of our marketplace, um, and I, I don't mean this to be like a total shill of uh, what we're what we're building, but uh, this is what I know about, and uh, happy to share the details with you. But what we launched back in April was called the Magma Marketplace, and uh, you can buy and sell Lightning channels on there. And we've seen like quite a bit of adoption. I think we're up to like 66 Bitcoin have been deployed in Lightning channels since April. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we're on track to pass up a pool like later this year. Um, but uh, I'm also like reporting the, the APR that people are, are earning. So like, where does this yield come from? It's businesses that are buying channels so that their business can receive payments because inbound liquidity, it's like the whole thing that everybody's after. They need to be able to receive payments. And then uh, what we've also seen is that nodes will come through and they'll buy every single, uh, buy a channel from every single node. And as a result, they're bumping up their stats on the Lightning Network on these uh, lists. It becomes very competitive. If you think about like, like when you're setting up a business and who's going to be providing the payment service to you, like your, your options are Visa, MasterCard, American Express. But on the Lightning Network, we've got 17,000 nodes that can each provide this service to you. So we see rampant competition, um, which like as a result benefits, uh, benefits businesses, benefits consumers. So as a node runner, I buy my own liquidity to bump up my own stats in the ring. You can buy from uh, other other nodes. So like just buy a channel. Um, and like uh, DZ, I don't know, Danny DZ, he used to work for a cash app and now he's doing like DZ.io. Um, like when before he launched that service, he went through and he just like bought channels from everybody. And like he became a very well-connected node. Um, and then like now he's got that positioning in the network um, to like launch his service. Does that mean that it's just like too too cheap to be able to buy connectivity from someone? Is there like a market rate for like how much it costs to buy a buy a connection by a channel? Uh, let's see. Um, or how do you, I guess how do you do it? Right. Uh, okay, I'll I'll talk about that. Um, we've split up the uh, we split up magma into like two separate sections, uh, which we'll call Magma Connect. And so this is targeted at uh, businesses and new nodes. 
So these are the folks doing the initial bootstrapping of their nodes. So they'll go through and they'll pay for channels and they can also create bulk channel orders. Um, so this is the bid side of the market. So uh, in the listing, there's like several nodes um, which you can buy from and they'll actually set their pricing. Um, there's a lot of optionality currently in the marketplace. So it comes out with a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different numbers here and we're working to like narrow that down, make a very simple marketplace. But uh, it matters who you're buying from. Uh, so on Ambos, we're like, we, you can uh, research any of the nodes. We give each node a profile page to look up market uh, stats on them. So in the bulk buy channels, we'll go through that workflow. So you say, how much liquidity do you need? So maybe you need a Bitcoin uh, over the next month. So that means uh, that would be buying the liquidity so that you would receive $16,000, $17,000 worth of commerce uh, from the network. And uh, if you're gonna buy from many nodes, uh, this, this bid side, you're setting the parameters on the minimum channel size that you want. So that influences the payment sizes and also the maximum size. Uh, so the reason you would set a maximum size is because uh, you may want to source liquidity from multiple sources on the network and not just one payment provider. And then set the price, uh, how much you're gonna pay for this. You can also set terms, which is like uh, keep the channel open for one month uh, which is kind of the example I said. And then uh, which routing fees um, are they allowed to charge? So on Magma, like Ambus doesn't do enforcement, but we, what we do have control over is a reputation score, which would affect like how you're ranked in the marketplace and like whether we're going to suggest uh, other folks connect to you. You can also set requirements. Uh, so this would be the, the terminal web rank. I want a, a channel from only the top 150 nodes on the network. Um, I need a capacity of one Bitcoin and maybe I can only connect to Tor nodes. So only Tor, um, but I, you could also set it to uh, ClearNet if you want. And then like have a certain channel count over 15. Yeah. How do you, you said you don't enforce because you can't. How do you handle uh, random forced closures that aren't the fault of the node? Yeah. And that decreases the reputation. Yeah. Um, so we're uh, we just added the ability to like detect forced closures, um, which is like the whole like investigative yeah. uh, exercise. Um, and I I think like the the rate of forced closures for a node is like going to be an important piece of that reputation. But for the channel that you've ordered, um, like, like obviously if the forced closure happened, like that's not a good sign. Um, right. And it, it could be either one of our faults if I bought a that's channel from you. Yeah, so, so my reputation would be that like it would be a detriment to my reputation. Yes. If you accidentally forced closed the, the channel that I opened for you. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. you see what I mean? Like, yeah. And then the other thing is how do you handle the terminal web changing the ranking, them changing the algorithms behind the scenes, and then yeah. suddenly you were number 12, and then now you're number 79. Right. Like, how does that, does uh, that impact? As far as our, like, the reputation, uh, the reputation calculation has a small portion that comes from Terminal Web. Um, so it's not super impactful right now. I think at this stage, uh, we weight really heavily how quickly people are responding. Because if I'm a business, and payments aren't going through on the Lightning Network, and I'm just having to stare at my customer that's wanting to pay for this thing, and I'm gonna have to tell them, well, we're gonna have to go on chain for this, just like wait there for an hour as we get six confirmations. Like that, it seems ridiculous. So you want uh, want like really fast response times mm -hmm. um, to like get that liquidity. So we're rewarding nodes for opening quickly and being very responsive because when you have a liquidity issue, you need to fix that immediately. And so does that, does that mean that, that everyone is mostly clear net? Or is it just 
Uh, for the channel setup, like uh, yes. I, I think it's the same. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, uh, these are like very flexible parameters. Uh, you set what you want, um, judging by kind of what you need. The other side of the marketplace uh, we're calling Magma Earn. So that would be for LSPs and established nodes. The the routing nodes that are like earning a return on investment, um, like they're getting paid by these folks over here. Um, and uh, once they've like got that reputation, then they can start monetizing it. So on this side, you're going to be offering channels. So this is the ask side. And then uh, they can also go through and just fulfill those bulk channel orders uh, that was set up on this side. So like on Connect, they're saying like, open a channel to me, I'll pay you this much. And then on this side, it's like, okay, I'll just go through and uh, yeah, get paid to open channels. So like looking through this listing, uh, here are the folks that are willing to buy channels from you. So like I tried to set reasonable pricing here. This is my node. Um, but yeah, so I'll, I figure this is where the market will um, arrive. All right. So uh, actually, question. So the, I'm a business and I want to buy liquidity. So I post on this board. You go to connect. Up. Yeah, you go on the connect side. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you would buy. say bulk buy channels. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the that is or is not automated for me as a business. Like, what do you mean automated? Like, can, can I just say like I want to buy this much inbound liquidity with these parameters uh, through your website, and then your website coordinates all this stuff and just automatically sends it to my node, or do uh, I have to manually choose each one of those and then so like or you, wait for someone to buy my listing? Yeah, or the interaction that you'll see is. Uh, we have a, a Telegram bot, um, which, and we could also do um, email and webhook notifications saying like, what's the next step? Um, so it's like either now open a channel or pay this invoice. Um, so you'll you'll see those things pop up. It's not fully automated at this point. Okay. So this is like, I, I think it's orchestrated. It's not automated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but but it's it's like primed for automation. And right. we've actually opened up the API. So if you want to build an automation tool for this, like it's it's all there. Um, and like we've seen significant demand for it, but like caveat, we're That's a team of four. So there's essentially two marketplaces. There's essentially two marketplaces. Both people who want to earn and connect are listing what they want on both sides. Yeah. And nobody's connected those two things. I have, I, like the only way it happens is if I go to the earn side and purchase it myself. Yeah. Uh, the, there isn't, um, yeah, we had to build out both sides to like get like better pricing because what we saw was a whole bunch of people were saying like, like I'll open a channel to you and I'll set like this ridiculously high price. And then those offers are just kind of stale there. Yeah. So like There's adding the, yeah, you're saying, yeah. Yeah. yeah, feel free to come down if you want. Um, Could I like go in and connect to a bunch? So like do a bunch on that side and then flip over to be earning since now I have a well-connected node. Totally. So now I can flip over to earn and I kind of like yeah. offsets the payment. On the and it, side. Yeah. So you just need liquidity though, right? Well, you buy the liquidity on the connect side. Once you get a bunch of people, then you switch over to the earn side. But liquidity when you buy it is coming towards you and the liquidity when you're selling has to come from you. Uh, you, you, yeah. you deploy more Bitcoin. Yeah, you just put your own Bitcoin. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, like on the Connect side, you can see there's like 56 offers. Um, and make this a little larger. Yeah. And on the Earn side, uh, there's not a ton of nodes that are like saying, "I'll pay you for a channel." Um, because like this side, these are a bunch of folks looking to improve their rankings, um, uh, or or businesses. Yeah. Do you actually, I'm just curious, do you actually see uh, large scale nodes, routing nodes, using the earn functionality? Like, do you expect that to happen? Uh, or is that the expectation? Yeah, they, I mean, like, uh, it's, let's see, we've organized the market in a bit of a confusing way, but like on the connect side, this is where 
like when people post a sell channel, it will show up on the connect side <laughs> because it's like, I was trying to organize it based on who's, who's visiting. Yeah. Okay. So like, these are the, who's visiting is the business folks. And so here's who, who you could buy from. It's a bit confusing, yeah. Yeah. but on the earn side, okay, I'm here to make, take in sats <laughs> and put out channels. Okay. Yeah. You see, um, now like no one's, yeah. no one's done this before. So we're trying out the UX like yeah. for the first time. Yeah. Um, it's an exciting place to be. Similar to first, first item. <laughs> What's that? Similar to first. I got like the urn and the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right. So, yeah. On the yeah, there's more. There's more seats in the front. So. So like on the, on the earn side, uh, you can like, this is where routing nodes would offer up their liquidity and say like, I've got, you know, three Bitcoin that I'm willing to offer in channels. Um, similarly, you can set the parameters that you're willing to open. People don't like small channels generally. Um, and then set the prices that you'll charge. Um, like Plebnet like loves this. I mean, they just like say like, okay, like I'm, it's helps them discover new nodes to connect to really. Um, yeah. Do you kind of have like a guide from people who are speaking or is this, is this really for someone that kind of has already been in the Plebnet community for a while? And like, or if I wanted to get into this as a complete newbie, mm -hmm. There be some sort of guide to get me through all of this to go, okay, um, people don't prefer smaller channels, so do this, and like, you write, like, yeah. recommend this, or is that not really? Uh, BTC Sessions has done like a, mm -hmm. a full video, like mm -hmm. all the steps, um, and uh, Jonathan Levi as well. Um, be cool to have a tutorial like for someone that's going through this flow for the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then they can be like, oh, okay, I know that. It's like if I set my minimum SAS to this amount, then maybe there's something that pops up that says, "Hey, we recommend that you go above this amount right now." Right. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Map, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just, just coming up with some ideas. Yeah, we we know it's like it's super complicated right now. Yeah. At the, as like we're we're doing like iterations all the time, but. It's cool, it's really cool. Um. So yeah. The channel duration, there's like a drop down so you can select like one month up to up to six months uh, now and uh, also set the requirements. Um, the requirements here might be important because if you're selling channels, sometimes you can't connect to a Tor node unless they connect to you first. So here you could specify, I only want clear net nodes, for example. Um, one of the like inspirations for actually setting up this marketplace was uh, Nick Batia's work in 2019, um, which was called the time value of, of Bitcoin. So it's been on my mind uh, like since then. Um, and part of this is he just came up with a simple formula just to have something um, which he called the node accrual rate, the NAR. And he's just looking at the node balance um, and then how they earn fees from routing payments, which is like primarily at the, at, at the time, this is where nodes would actually make money. They charge a certain fee for routing a payment from one peer to another peer. And uh, there's also, he did this in blocks. So this is the time component of this. And it is in a way compounding. Uh, one of the assumptions, uh, just because of how early it was, is just the income is from uh, routing payments and not from the sale of channels, which is the uh, what we're doing with Magma. So we made uh, kind of the opposite side of that is the channel sale focused um, uh, return on investment. So what we have is the the APR. 
So this is uh, what a business would be paying uh, to have this payment service. So that's why it's uh, annual percentage rate is APR. But there's the channel base fee, which was part of that form that I showed, the channel fee rate, uh, capacity, and the time. There's some assumptions with this as well. It leaves out routing income and assumes, since we're annualizing it, that the channel is going to get repurchased at the same rate, which is a big, it's a big assumption. Uh, so, all right, the data. This is uh, core of what we do. So what we're seeing, uh, and I'm showing the, the APR over time, and also kind of a, a version of the note accrual rate as well, which is in, uh, kind of converted that channel sale into the NAR and assumed that they're going to route 100% of the channel at the maximum fee that they're charging. So this is like a reasonable upper bound for uh, what I would expect people to earn. Could earn more, but um, but overall, what we're seeing is uh, about one and a half to three percent earnings uh, per year for this stuff that's on Magma, and uh, created that channel sale NAR one hundred, which is a channel sale plus that max routing fee, and. Uh, a caveat is that the mempool has been pretty empty. Um, does this count for submarine spots? Uh, no. Um, and actually, we don't have a, a submarine swap. Okay. <sighs> All right. Submarine comes from the word like, okay, it's like half above the water, half below. Yeah. And uh, what we did add was magma swaps. So you can actually trade lightning sats or on-chain bitcoin um and and there my feeling is there is a market there but uh hasn't really gotten a lot of uptake um i haven't but seen people use it you wouldn't be able to see it because it's just someone paying an invoice right yeah behind the scenes and someone else sending it's like a provider flipping so you wouldn't be able to see it in a chart like this yeah. right but the my question is um, you know, the assumption is like you're getting inbound liquidity for this much amount of Bitcoin at this percent, but with submarine swapping, you can replenish that liquidity and you have to purchase another one, right? Uh, so you it's, can like double it's true. on this. Yeah. Because um, because ultimately, my question is like credit card fees. Like, does this really usurp credit card fees? Like, the whole point was to reduce the fees, but I'm essentially paying lightning liquidity providers a service fee. Mm -hmm. To receive inbound payments, and there's a flat amount of income, like amount of sales that I can receive for that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, yeah, yeah. is it economically feasible? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Will, yeah. Is is it cheaper than Visa? Right. Especially yeah. credit card fees will start getting undercut with things like Fed Now, direct bank payments. Yeah, yeah. It's it's true. Yeah, uh, simply the creation of a channel, like, and not trying to like make a ton off of it, you can do that um, about 30 times cheaper than the Visa. But it doesn't really take into account like um, the cost of obtaining liquidity because like you can't provide this service if you're not connected to anyone. Right. You can't just do it yourself. Yeah. It relies on the network like changing shape in order to make these payments happen. Yeah. Um, it's just... Yeah, wild. if you make the ability to do submarine swaps, on top of this, I think it would be more attractive for me as a business because now I don't have to keep purchasing liquidity to keep bringing in yeah. instead of I can just swap it out. So yeah. It's cheaper for me, but like the person who's on this, uh, who's providing liquidity, they're getting paid the same amount anyways. Yeah. yeah. What What happened on week forty one? Huh? Like I I I don't know. Uh, one of the things that uh, his, like I know is influencing things is the cost of the mempool because in order to create a channel, this is an on-chain transaction and like you know what the what the fee you're paying is when you open the channel, but there's also a bet on the future to say, well, like you're going to close this channel eventually. What's the closure cost going to be? Yeah. Um, and then uh, another factor to take into account is the duration of channels. So this is like 
what a lot of economists like to look at is the yield curve. <laughs> so uh, depending on the channel duration, we do see that different APRs are being paid for. Right. And what we see is that folks are willing to pay more for a fresh channel that's only open for a month, um, more than they will for a channel that's open for, they're promising a year. And as, uh, as you pointed out earlier, there could be forced closures here that, that just unintended that you know, maybe this deal falls through and you're still like kind of out the money, you know, for this, but would take a reputation impact. Why do you think that is? Why do you think people want to pay for it for a new channel? Just for that um, one, it could be, uh, it's a, more often than not, it's a new connection. So it's a connection that you, that you don't already have. Um, is, I mean, with 17,000 options, yeah. like, who do you really want to connect to? Um, and, you know, maybe they're uh, like buying a channel from zero fee routing. It's like, very popular thing. And like, that's where he was making money on the channel sales and not on the routing of payments. Um, yeah. So buying a channel from bit refill, for example, would be like, like I would, I would love to do that. That's like, it's got lots of, lots of connections already very central to the network and they're allocating Bitcoin in my direction so that I can receive payments and do so reliably. Is, is there also an aspect where it's like, uh, just because the length of time, it automatically means the APR is lower. Like, uh, because it's one month, it's a flat fee. And so that just means it's going to be higher in, in terms of APR. But if it's a whole month thing and I'm buying liquidity. Yeah. It's, it's, There's yeah. the capacity element to, as well. Right. Like, okay, if I buy a Bitcoin channel and I like say for six months, but I do a Bitcoin in volume the first month, then like, what's the point of keeping the channel open? Because I already used it up. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, how do you see the fact that in the last three months, from August to November, the one month channel dropped at least half on their APR? That's what this chart, right? Uh, yeah. Since August to November. Right, August is almost six percent. November is almost three percent for the one month. Yeah. How do you like? That's a half percent drop. Uh, that's a a half. You know, 50% drop yeah. on a uh, three month difference. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I mean what, what factors would you look at? I don't know. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Like, why, yeah. why would someone in August, why would the data in general average 6% and yeah. then in November it averages to half of that? Right. Like, why are people paying? You know, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll like skip ahead a bit, but kind of like long term, like we've seen the APRs like kind of go all over. Yeah. Um, so like initially, uh, like we're like just setting up at this point. So it's a very small market. And I imagine like there's some people will, wanting to test it out. Yeah. Uh, what's going to happen here? So you see the spikes. So it's, you're going to see spikes. Yeah. Um, and also just, uh, so there's like the volume component. Um, and also like there's mempool. Uh, I think that's, those are big influences. Yeah, so at the end of the year is going well. Uh, yeah, we also saw the mempool start to fill up. Um, and what else happened? Uh, let's see, FTX. <laughs> um, a lot of trolls. Yeah. Just okay. The the custodial yields products uh, all went kaput. Yeah. So like, what well, what I have on Magma is a non custodial yield product. Yeah. Um, which means like, like there's some trust in Amboss to like set the thing up. Uh, but then after that, like, you don't have to trust us anymore. Yeah. Um, so anyways, so in conclusion, so we got, uh, lightning node operators are providing this, uh, reliable payment service and these, uh, bids and asks are really setting the price. Um, and then the earnings range from uh, one and a half to 3%, um, for the stuff that is being sold on Magma. And um, if you want to check out more of our website, there's way more on there. Um, <laughs> this is just one small piece of it, uh, but feel free to check it out. We're always really open to feedback um, because like, we're just pioneering the, the UX of this. Um, so 
anything doesn't work out for you, like this would make more sense. Like, man, we want to hear it. And, oh, here. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Uh, any other questions that folks have? Um, <laughs> Where did Amboss? Uh, yeah. So uh, Amboss, um, like, let's see. My co-founder is in Germany. Uh, he's like based in Munich, and he was a developer behind uh, Thunder Hub. Uh, so we've been kind of splitting between like European time zones and U.S. time zones. Uh, Amboss is the German word for anvil to fit with all the, the lightning and Thor and hammer imagery and Zeus stuff. So uh, we just thought it sounded nice as like a, a robust platform to do lightning work. What's, okay, so you mentioned a lot of risks for, and it sounded like the risks were more for operating one you know, mm -hmm. but what are the risks of me using your service? Like, how, are there any risks associated with that? You know, like, are you calling APIs into our node? Like, what, is there some, yeah. Uh, no, like the, um, like you may, you have to maintain the security of your private key. I mean, it's mostly operator focused risk. Um, what we use are HODL invoices. Um, and the risks of using a HODL invoice is that like, it keeps a pending payment like Lots in the channel. Yeah. So, uh, and there's only like 483 uh, slots available for pending payments of pending HTLC. Uh, once you get to that point, it becomes a griefing attack. Um, so this is something that I think should be really prioritized for the protocol developers uh, to mitigate that griefing attack risk. Um, the other thing is uh, we're serving we're serving a different invoice than we've gotten from the other side to add this HODL invoice functionality. To like act like a smart contract, and so that involves risk. So that you could just be paying us, and we could run away with the funds. But we have no interest in doing that because as soon as we do that, like we lose. So you don't serve. You're just like easy. You're you're like faking the swap. You take the Bitcoin and you do the other side. Now, uh, not faking, yeah, but it's um, it's easier. So. One thing that we do because of uh, money transmission regulations is that we're actually uh, the only way for us to accept the payment and settle the HODL invoice is if we've proved that we've paid this and we have the pre-image oh, so for you it. Ahead. So we we you're pay taking out. Risk. You're taking that. Yeah, you're, taking, you're taking. You're Yeah. Yeah. So this is um, like a provisioning service. Yeah. I'm provisioning a channel for you yeah. by interfacing with the market. Yeah. Um, it's very nuanced, uh, but Are but you I. A fee off of the routes and the so the at the at the hotel invoice, that's where we'll introduce a fee. Um, normally, it's a uh, thousand ppm, so 0.1 percent of the capacity, uh, but we've reduced it um, recently to 100 ppm, so 0 0.01 percent. Yeah, uh, it's like super. Is there the risk of like disintermediation between the two parties? Like, since you're kind of like connecting them, could they, after they've gone through once and they have like a good relationship, say they only do it like a month, like the next month, could they just like talk offline and then connect directly to each other? Sure. Yeah. And it, like, like, that would be great. Yeah. Um, That's the worst thing. Yeah. Uh, our thinking is like by aggregating like bids and bids and asks, like we should be able to deliver better pricing um, and more market discovery than people talking offline. Um, yeah. I've got a right tie blitz and I've killed it a couple times and tried to set up channels. And yeah. I really sucked at it. How does this, would this, your product simplify all that for me? Because I just started fresh, I got a new image. Can I go on here and kill a channel setup? Uh, yeah, I think maybe just going through and, and buying some channels. Still 
yeah, go and connect, um, bootstrap your node, get a whole bunch of connections, um, and then you can start earning from it as well. I think you would want to like have like, a pretty well good setup though, right? Because your reputation will go down if you're like you're, you blow up your raspy blitz, or, like the power goes off, then your reputation will go down. Yeah, I think you probably would want to have like a pretty robust node before getting on here, right? Uh, well, people can go onto the, we built like the connect side so that people can use it for bootstrapping. Um, but you do need like one channel to be discovered. Um, so we need to see you in the graph. I'm going to try it. Yeah. We have one more. It's the last one. I got here late, so we talked about this already. Uh, what did you think of Norad crashing down on the network twice? What was your favorite? Uh, oh, Barack? Yeah. 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 Um, I, I have a very small node. Yeah, I was a bit of an eye opener. It, risk that while I was able to crash the network for such a short time period. So here's yeah. I mean, the second time was like clearly intentional. Um, and he spoke at adopting Bitcoin in El Salvador. And what I heard from that talk is that like he doesn't feel any remorse for doing that. Um, which uh, I mean, it's a bit troubling. Like I mean. Like a lot of a lot of the Lightning Network like wants wants this system to work. Like, I mean, looking at the rise of Plebnet, like they were like the El Salvador law had just been passed, and they're thinking like everyone's thinking like, oh crap, like like the payment network is not ready. Like, how do we how do we build this as fast as we can? And then like Plebnet took off because they were, it was a like, very altruistic minded. However, like not everybody's going to be altruistic. Minded. Um, in fact, like we need, in a way, lightning needs enemies. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's just yeah, and he exploited it. Um, and we have to be like thoughtful of those things. Um, be way ahead. Yeah. Personally, I think there are ways and ways that. 10 minutes before he sent that mainnet transaction, he broke testnet. Okay, he didn't need to send the mainnet. Right. They broke testnet three. It was clear that it was going to yeah. happen in mainnet. He could have voiced some concerns and he just right. ran and said, fuck, yeah. I'm going to do it. So I think that the network has to be adversarial. That's a given. And I support all of that. But yeah. like if he did it by accident, it was a very knowing, like, I am going to break that. And then the yeah. second time he did it, he made a freaking post and, po and put. Core Lightning, this and this and this. And you'll, like, you'll run Core Lightning, you'll be this happy. Is, this yeah. is getting territorial, right? Like, that's not what it's about. It, this is not being adversarial. This is exploiting a vulnerability in another community. Yeah. That I didn't like. Um, I like that it's adversarial, but yeah. there are ways and ways, I think. It's a little bit political. Yeah, it was a little yeah. bit like, well, yeah, why are you doing that? Stream and then like, it's like black stream versus yeah, yeah. Uh, I certainly don't want to start any witch hunt against it. I mean, people are in Bitcoin for all sorts of reasons, and it could have just as easily been a Fed that did it or something. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Thanks, Jesse. Let's give him a hand. Thank you.